Microsoft sent us across the Surface Pro 9 5G for the week, and I've been using it instead of my usual Surface Pro 8 LTE. This is the new Surface Pro with the SQ3 processor, a collaboration between US-based mobile processor giant Qualcomm and Microsoft. So this is the 5G version of the Surface Pro 9, and it uses an ARM-based processor, the SQ3, and the Wi-Fi-only version has an Intel processor. The Intel version of the Pro 9 has a 12th generation Core i5 or i7, and it runs Windows 11 like any other PC. But this one, the 5G, runs Windows 11 on ARM. Similar, and just as powerful, but there are some differences to be aware of, and there are some advantages and some disadvantages of the platform that I'll discuss. The version that I've received has 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 256 gigabyte SSD, which is about the sweet spot for a mobile worker like me. Physically, you can tell it apart from the Intel version by these antenna lines, and you can see them around the edges of the device. Compared to the Pro 8, the USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports have been moved over to the left side, and the volume and power buttons have returned back to the top, just like they were on the earlier Surface Pro models. And before I go on, I wanna point out that I'm not a professional YouTuber or a tech blogger. I have a real job delivering technology training and coaching to real people doing real jobs too. I go to meetings, I do a lot of presentations, I travel for work. I mention that because I see a lot of content created by people who create YouTube videos for a living, and that's a great and worthy occupation, but it's not what most people do with their computing devices. And as a result, I think that most of the videos that I see around products like Surface don't do the device or the users justice. So here's what I found with the Surface Pro 9 5G. The early days of Windows on ARM devices like the Surface Pro X were for enthusiasts only. Things were tricky, apps were limited, those that did work were often sluggish, and you could forget about things like printing. But the platform showed promise, and those enthusiasts who hung around were eventually rewarded with the 64-bit app support that came under Windows 10, and later Windows 11 on ARM 2. So I got right into setting up the device and installing my favorite apps. The device actually shipped with the Windows 11 2022 mid-year update, also known as 22H2. The out-of-box experience is smoother and slicker than it ever was before in Windows, even including the option to set up based on a previous backup. I opted not to restore as I wanted to have that full first-time experience. Like all Surface Pros, since the Surface Pro 4, the Pro 9 has a Windows Hello face recognition camera so that I can log in without a password. The Windows Hello setup was quick and easy, and I was set up and logging into the Surface Pro 9 with my face in just a few minutes. I activated Office and opted into the Office Insiders program, the beta channel, to test out the upcoming OneNote features like transcription and improved inking. The Surface Pro 9 5G, like the other Surface Pro 9 and the Pro 8, has a 13-inch 3x2 120Hz display that supports the new Slim Pen 2 with its haptic feedback. At last, the combination of this incredible pen hardware is matched with the capabilities of the software. The new ink mode in OneNote makes writing in portrait mode a pleasure. This is where you'll really feel at home with a slate tablet that reflects the size and ratio of an A4 sheet of paper. The 3x2 display is brilliant for note taking in portrait or landscape. And now with 120 hertz and practically zero lag, the Slim Pen 2 feels remarkably like writing with pen on paper. There are even subtle haptic feedback signals from the pen that make the page feel like it has texture. If you bought the Pro 9 5G for note taking in OneNote, you wouldn't be disappointed, especially when this update ships into the mainstream soon. I went to the Microsoft Store and downloaded some of my favorite multi-platform apps like Shaper 3D and Concepts. Those apps performed brilliantly as expected. Like Microsoft Office, they have been compiled by the developers to run specifically for ARM processors. On the older Surface Pro X models, I didn't have much luck with printers. Printer manufacturers typically don't publish specific drivers for Windows on ARM devices, so you had to try and work around that with the generic printer driver. Now, I'm not a fan of printing, so that didn't bother me too much. But with the Pro 9 5G, I searched for my brother color laser printer. It found it straight away and it installed a printer driver. Within seconds, I was printing, prints came out in color as expected, and it printed on both sides. Now, not every printer will have good compatible printer drivers, so your mileage may vary, but there are many ways that you can get past printer driver limitations if you experience them. You may need to be a bit resourceful. I use Microsoft Edge for web browsing and my browser profile imported all of my extensions, history bookmarks and collections when I opened it. Edge runs natively on ARM processors, so I didn't notice any major difference when browsing on the Pro 9 5G. If you're still using Google Chrome, you probably know very well that it is a massive resource hog and battery life destroyer. It's one of the key reasons that I moved to Microsoft Edge. Also, Google don't compile Chrome for ARM processors, so it'll be emulating further penalizing performance and battery life. Not only is Edge running natively, it has a setting called efficiency mode. Now you can use that mode to optimize battery life when you're on the go. 
I also use Edge because it's really pushing the boundaries with multimodal web browsing with things like inking on web pages and PDFs and read aloud mode. It all worked exceptionally well on the Pro 9 5G. Wanting to go beyond the apps that I knew would work well, I installed 1Password. In the past, it worked on Windows on ARM, but it was frustratingly slow with emulation. There has been a new version of 1Password since I last used it on the Pro X, and I was impressed at how this worked on the Pro 9 5G, even though it wasn't natively compiled for the ARM processor. You almost couldn't tell that the app was being emulated at all. As a part of my 3D print workflow, I use Ultimaker Cura to slice and prepare 3D models that I build in Shaper 3D for 3D printing. Cura is a multi-platform app that is built on the Electron framework. The Electron framework has been ported to Windows on ARM, but we rely on Electron developers to build their apps for ARM on the framework. The Cura team has not yet done that, but it is an open source project, so there's always the possibility that someone in the Cura community will do that at some point. However, it did work fine on the Surface Pro 9 5G. Cura in its default setup is always slow to load, and it wasn't noticeably slower on the Pro 9 5G. Next, I went to ClipChamp, the simple video editor that was developed here in Brisbane, Australia, and was recently purchased by Microsoft. It's a clever video editing package. It is a progressive web app, but it uses local and cloud resources to get the job done. I loaded up a 20 gigabyte video project to see how it performed. Editing within the app was occasionally glitchy, but it was mostly smooth sailing. Exporting a video was slow going, but that's not a reflection on this device. It's something that needs to be improved in the app on all platforms, not just Windows on ARM. While I was in the Microsoft store, I noticed that the Windows subsystem for Android was finally officially available here in Australia. So I installed it, and the Amazon Store app so that I could download the Android Kindle app onto the device. The Amazon App Store is extremely disappointing in Australia, it's virtually bare, but it is possible to hack your way around this limitation and directly install Android apps. What I found was that the Kindle app ran very well on the SQ3 processor. It was snappy, it felt responsive, and the processor overhead to run Android on top of Windows was remarkably small, usually less than 10%. In the evening, I watched a couple of episodes of an old favorite series, and I was blown away by the sound of the Pro 9. It was loud, clear, and crisp. Dolby Atmos spatial sound is on by default, and video looked great, but with that high resolution 120 hertz display, that was to be expected. At home, I charged the device with a PD charger that I bought from Amazon. We'll leave our affiliate links to these products below, by the way. And although the device ships with a proprietary Surface Connect charger, I find that I very rarely use it with my Surface devices these days. Next day in the office, I connected the Pro 9 to the Philips widescreen display on my desk, this display connects directly into either one of the Pro 9's two Thunderbolt USB-C ports, and it can charge the device at 90 watts using the PD standard too. According to the battery app, I'd be at full charge in one hour and 30 minutes from 20%. No need to carry a power cord or to have the dock on the desk, just this one monitor and cable for everything. Oh, and by the way, the monitor also has some USB-A ports on the back so that you can connect other wired devices. It's effectively a dock and a display and it worked like that on the Pro 9 5G. I went about loading up Microsoft Teams and Outlook, which pushed the processor a little bit during setup, but still never over 80%. And it barely ever felt warm, even at that level. Once they were set up, they worked as expected. The Pro 9 5G offers some unique features thanks to its ARM processor design that includes what they call an NPU, or a Neural Processing Unit. The NPU is used to deliver multimedia features like voice focus, automatic video framing, and a very smooth hardware-based background blur with minimal impact on power consumption and performance. You'll find that the background blur that you enable in the Surface app on the Pro 9 5G is a lot better than the dodgy cutout that Teams or even Zoom can do in software. Another benefit of the ARM platform is that it's extremely efficient at video encoding and decoding, and that has become a pretty important aspect of modern work with all of the video conferencing that we do. You can test the new video features in the camera app and they work really smoothly there, Initially, I had a few glitches with getting video to work on Teams, but I can't say for sure that that wasn't a problem with Teams as it does happen sometimes. Over the week though, I did a lot of video calls. People noticed the background blur because it was so good, and occasionally they would notice the movement of the automatic video framing. I found that that was a lot less aggressive on the Surface Pro 9 5G than it is on other devices like the iPad Pro. That made it a lot less distracting on a call. It was hard for me to tell if the voice focus feature made much of a difference because the other Surface devices with their dual Farfield Studio microphones do a pretty good job of filtering out noise in conjunction with Teams anyway. And I wasn't about to bring a hairdryer or a drill to my meeting to test it out in the short time that I had with it. Whereas Intel processors tend to run hot when you're video conferencing, the Pro 9 5G does not. 
And that means that it doesn't need a fan, and it also means better battery life when you're watching stuff or video calling, and that's one of the key advantages of going to ARM over Intel processors. On a Teams call, I was able to happily run multiple applications and collaborate on a whiteboard, and the device never showed any signs of weakness. Like all previous Surface Pros, this one has a camera on the back too. It's a simple 10 megapixel camera that can do 4K video, I use it mainly to take photos of documents and whiteboards, and there is an office lens mode that's built into the camera app that detects the edges of your documents and squares up the shot like a scanner. It's very handy to have, and most laptops of course don't have a camera on the back. Back on the microphones, I tested out captions in PowerPoint. When I present, I always turn on live captions so that people can clearly understand me. With my Surface Pro 8, I've been presenting in PowerPoint and standing five or six meters away from the device, and the captions still work incredibly well. I had the same experience here as I expected, and if I'm presenting to an audience that speaks another language natively, I make sure that I run my captions in that language, using live AI-powered translations. It's not perfect, but we don't let perfect be the enemy of good, and the potential here for communicating with people more effectively is very good. With Windows 11 22H2, you can even run system-wide captions through the live captions app. What an amazing assistive technology. I set up my own caption style for the app so that I could see it clearly, and then I tried it out. Can you imagine how game-changing it is for people with a hearing impairment to have this built into their device? Now, I typed more than half of this 4,000-word script using the Dictate feature in Microsoft OneNote while at my home office and in one of our quiet spaces at work. Creating a script like this is really well suited to voice dictation. And Dictate in Microsoft Office in Windows 11 works incredibly well to even understand very broad and specific accents like my Aussie drawl. It can even understand the difference between an Australian and a New Zealand accent, and I'm tipping that most of our audience outside of those two countries wouldn't be able to tell a difference. I also tested the upcoming transcription feature of OneNote. If you haven't seen this yet, it is game-changing. OneNote transcripts will allow you to record and transcript your in-person meetings. You could already do this on a Teams meeting, and it links the transcript and the recording to the notes that you take in the meeting. This will allow people to stop typing in meetings and to focus on being together. It'll change the entire feeling of meetings, not to mention their efficiency. Now, I've never met anyone who wants to do more meetings, and I think that the use of technology has turned many meetings into a complete ineffective debacle. But features like transcripts in OneNote, in conjunction with skilled, trained people, have the potential to change that. You'll need a device that's up to the task of identifying and differentiating between multiple people speaking in a room this one is. And it's not hard to see that in future, this tech will be used to identify and suggest action items from meetings, kind of like Outlook does with Viva Insights. This has the potential to really change the way we meet. This feature will mark the inflection point where technology stops being a barrier in meetings and actually becomes assistive. Can you now start to imagine how important those two little microphones and the NPU are in this new Surface Pro 9 5G? I learned about the importance of high quality microphones when I visited Microsoft's Human Factors Lab at Redmond for the first time back in 2017. They have an anechoic chamber in the lab that is registered with the Guinness Book of Records as the quietest place on earth. It's fascinating and disconcerting to be in a room which registers at minus 20 decibels of sound because the hairs inside of your ears stop moving there's simply nothing there to stimulate them. And it feels like the pressure that you might feel on a plane flight. And Microsoft have facilities like this, not just so that they can be in the Guinness Book of Records, but so that they can build and test microphone systems like the one that we find here on the Surface Pro 9 5G. In my experience, these microphones blow away anything else that you'll find in an equivalent device. But I think that most people have not yet thought to test the microphones on their devices let alone to choose a device based on the microphone experience. But when you see features like live captions, voice dictation, and transcription in action, you suddenly realize that these things were far more important than they ever were before, and that microphones should be high on your device decision list, along with the pen experience, the touchscreen, the cameras, and the keyboard and the touchpad. Most people, YouTubers, judge these devices based on the keyboard alone and some random benchmarks. You won't change the world following those reviewers. Throughout the whole week, I kept an eye on the CPU usage. I never once saw it hit 100%, even though I was throwing a lot at the device. Now, I don't care about benchmarks. I care about coming up with new ideas, creating, collaborating, problem solving, getting things done. And the Surface Pro 9 5G has plenty of power for that. And as more app developers target Windows on ARM, it'll become even more impressive. The other advantage that ARM has is connectivity. And that's thanks to companies like Qualcomm, who've invested billions into connectivity technologies like 4G and 5G. They've done that on ARM platforms. And as a result, the Microsoft SQ3 chip can have 5G connectivity, 
not as a separate add-on module, but integrated right into the processor. This is faster and more efficient. And although I didn't get to test 5G as I only had a 4G SIM card to use for the week, moving between Wi-Fi and 4G LTE was pretty seamless. Okay, so there's lots to love about the Pro 9 5G, but what didn't go well? Well, over the first couple of days when I was setting up the device, I did experience some weird pauses. Only a couple of seconds each, but it seemed like the device would lock up and then come back again. Watching the task manager, I could see that it wasn't a performance issue, but some sort of bottleneck or glitch. A firmware update arrived via Windows updates, and that seemed to fix the issue. Dropbox still don't make an ARM version of their Windows Sync client. OneDrive is a better alternative for most things these days anyway, and it works on the Pro 9 5G. You can still access Dropbox via the web, but that's not a very elegant solution. Google Drive Desktop Sync is also exactly the same. This type of app can't be emulated, so it needs to be compiled specifically for Windows on ARM. Now, I deliberately didn't mention Adobe apps yet because their ARM device support has been, well, I can only say appalling. Way back in 2019, Adobe demonstrated the new Fresco digital drawing app on the Surface Pro X and then never released it. Once or twice a year for three years, someone would pop up into the Adobe support forum and say, hey, we're working on it. Still nothing. Eventually, Adobe did release a somewhat complete version of Photoshop and Lightroom for Windows on ARM. It's Lightroom that I want the most, but after installing it through the Adobe Creative Cloud app, I just kept getting a bunch of errors. I didn't get it working. Now, we could blame Microsoft and the hardware for this, but I'd say that the issue here firmly sits with Adobe. Most other apps have just worked. With Adobe, not much is on offer and not much works. They don't offer any video editing apps for Windows and ARM yet, not even Premiere Rush, which would be a great addition to the Pro X and the Pro 9 5G. So all up, the situation with Adobe is disappointing. And this underlines a major problem with moving to an ARM-based device. We are relying on software developers to support it, at least to some extent. And that is a little bit of a chicken and egg conundrum. The developer will say, but there are no Windows on ARM users. And they'd be somewhat right, because important apps are not there for them to use. And unlike Apple, Microsoft won't force millions of users to simply switch platforms at their whim. They'll continue to support both Intel's x86 and ARM's RISC architecture, thereby creating a competitive situation where everybody ultimately wins. And remember that there are Intel versions of the Pro 9 available, albeit Wi-Fi only versions. But if you want Intel and always on 4G, Microsoft are keeping the Pro 8 LTE in production. So you don't have to switch to ARM if your apps and infrastructure don't support it yet. We've seen how healthy competition has transformed Microsoft. It has forced them to be less bureaucratic and antagonistic. They've become far more customer focused and agile than they could have ever been without fierce competition from Google, Amazon and Apple. Intel could do with some of the same. It'll be interesting to see how they answer this challenge over the next few years. Developers should keep in mind that Apple need competition in the ARM PC space too. History does inform astute software developers that Apple loves nothing more than to devour a market that was created by anyone who gets enough attention on their platform. Just ask Netflix, Spotify, and Tile. If you're developing an app solely for Apple's platforms, the clock is ticking for your company. Until Intel comes up with some miracles, ARM is the future of desktop computing, at least mobile desktop computing. I don't see ARM PCs replacing high-end Intel desktops for some time yet, and with this Surface Pro 9 5G and the latest version of Windows 11 on ARM, it feels like the time for ARM is now. So if you're a meeting note taker using Microsoft OneNote, an Office 365 user, a road warrior who needs simple, fast, always on connectivity, a Teams video conferencer who wants better battery life and a better look on the go, then this might well be your next device. But check with a real Surface expert before you leap. And if you're here in Australia or New Zealand, that's the team here at ASI Solutions, we joined this company because they do more with Surface than anyone else in Australia. They deal with small and large businesses, so contact us using the links below. And if you want to learn how to get more out of your Surface device, then you're in the right place because even though we sold our company to ASI, we continue to produce free YouTube videos that help you to do your best with Surface and Microsoft 365. So hit subscribe and the notification bell, and we'll see you next week.